Would you be willing to put yourself in danger to expose a lie? Nellie Bly did when she went to the insane asylum on Blackwell's Island and endured many horrible conditions during her 10-day stay. She also made a trip around the world in 72 days, which nobody had ever done before at the time. She married a man who was much older than she was. This man was Robert Seaman, and he was one of the richest people in the world at the time. She even patented the 55-gallon oil barrel after inheriting the company, becoming one of the richest women on the planet. After bad planning for her travels, she landed in Austria two days before the beginning of World War I and became one of the only American women to report on the Eastern Front of the war. A journalist of talent and spunk, a woman of strength and courage, and a person of determination, Nellie Bly pioneered the road for female and investigative journalism alike. But the thing she's remembered for all happened in two and a half years, between the ages of about 22 and 24. And that, that has created a legacy that has never, ever died. It's gone into hibernation a few times, but it has never died. Elizabeth Jane Cochran, later known as the famous Nellie Bly, was born in Cochran's Mills, Pennsylvania in 1864. Located just outside of Pittsburgh, the town was named after her father, a mill owner, and county judge, Michael Cochran. Nellie grew up in a family of 15 siblings, with her mother being Mary Jane Cochran. Mary was Michael's second wife, and he had five children with her. Nellie was Michael's 13th child. Nellie was given the nickname Pink due to the standout outfit her mother chose for her. Being only six, Elizabeth's father passed away. Nellie lost her beloved father, and he left no will about how to divide his estates. Nellie moved from her beautiful home in Apollo, Pennsylvania soon after with her mother and two of her brothers to move to a much smaller home in Apollo, the tenth of the size. Elizabeth's mother remarried after two and a half years of her husband being dead. She remarried to John Jackson Ford, a local policeman who was somewhat known in his community. He was an abusive drunk who hurt both his wife and Nellie herself. The treatment got so bad that Nellie's mother, Mary, decided to divorce her husband, which was very rare for the time. A woman of that era almost needed a working man to manage the property and expenses, so divorcing a man was not only particularly unheard of, it was a huge risk to the spouse and her children. Nellie testified against her abusive stepfather and later moved away with her mother. She continued her education after primary school in the Indiana Normal School for Women. She added a small inheritance from her late father that totaled roughly 400 U.S. dollars of the time. She ran out of finances right before the end of the first term of her schooling and was at a position where she had to leave. She then moved in with her mother and helped her run a boarding house in the nearby city of Pittsburgh. One day, Nellie read an article in the Pittsburgh Dispatch that completely slammed and criticized women's position in business and the workplace. Nellie, being upset and offended by the column, decided to write a letter to the author who went by the pen name Q.O., which stood for The Quiet Observer. His real name was Erasmus Wilson, and he was a Civil War veteran who ended up working for the Pittsburgh Dispatch. Upon receiving Bly's poorly written letter, Q.O. saw her potential as she furiously yet formally bashed and insulted his writings. Q.O. offered Nellie a job as he saw her potential. Even though respected, she as a female journalist was restricted to writing about women's topics, Things such as child-rearing, gardening, society, and heart. She did all this at the tender age of 16. Nellie Bly was fed up with only writing on domestic matters. Her bold personality craved more, and so she decided to become a special correspondent and travel to Mexico for half a year, where she covered the Mexican daily life, customs, habits, and living conditions. She provided cases to counter foreign stereotypes of Mexican people. She attempted to be as blunt as possible without risking jail or expulsion in the Diaz-ruled Mexico. The biggest reason for Bly's travels to Mexico was to show her editors that she was more than capable to cover topics outside of the realm of what was considered customary for female journalists. Upon her return from her trip, she decided it was best to leave the dispatch to pursue even greater fame and prominence. Nellie returned from her trip to Mexico empty. Her old routine in the dispatch was nothing compared to the vibrancy and pace of her journey. Nothing interested her anymore. Nellie published her last piece as a full-time staff member as the dispatch on March 20th, 1887. Her career for culture writing lasted three months, and after that, she hardly showed up for work. Erasmus Wilson, her editor, remembered the 17th clearly. He recalls no one knew where she was until a note was discovered. It read, Dear QO, I am off for New York. Look out for me.
Nellie Bly. I don't know how many people know who she is, but I think if they learned about her, yes, there's no reason she shouldn't be. Nellie Bly was given the opportunity to enter a madhouse and pretend to be insane by Colonel John Cockrell. She was able to convince many people she was insane because she practiced in front of a mirror many times. To get in front of a judge that would send her to Blackwell's Island, she acted oddly in front of the women at the boarding house she went to in New York. By the first night, she had convinced many of the women that she was crazy, and one girl even had a dream of Nellie killing her. She didn't sleep the whole first night to make her look even more insane, and sat on the end of the bed the whole night to give her the image of being crazy. She later said it was the greatest night of her existence. The next day, she kept asking for her trunks, and asking if anybody had seen them. Eventually, they took her to the authorities, and she was put in front of Judge Patrick Duffy. She was taken to the insane asylum after being pronounced insane by Dr. William C. Braisted. She arrived and had a terrible time. The food was awful and almost impossible to eat. They were given terrible-tasting bread, with even worse butter to go along, unsweetened tea, and a few prunes. She didn't have proper bedding and could not sleep well the whole time due to people walking around. She would have a freezing cold bath every week, and then had to be dried by a towel that had just dried everybody else. Then her hair was brushed very viciously, with the same brush that had just brushed every other member. Before Nellie took her trip into the madhouse on Blackwell's Islands, the conditions were terrible. The nurses clearly didn't care about the patient's feelings or thoughts, because every time a patient complained about anything, they were punished. The food was so bad, people would get sick from eating it, and the illness would sometimes kill them due to the lack of treatment for the patients. After Nellie came out about how terrible the asylum was, all of the apathetic nurses were fired and replaced with people who cared. There's a barrel of salt placed in front of the dining hall for all patients to use, and better food was provided. The patients didn't have to take cold baths anymore, and were given different towels to dry with. Proper bedding was also provided for a better experience for the insane. Another thing that happened after Nellie was in the asylum was there was a huge wave of women that went undercover in reporting. Women reporting also became even bigger, and more women were hired for reporting jobs. Women would go undercover for anything the newspaper companies could imagine. All of this happened because one lady was brave enough to go into a place that she had never been before and decide to try something crazy for the sake of others thing for her to do as an investigative journalist. However, I feel that the long-term benefits for mental health patients due to the institutional reforms and the new protective regulations that came out of that were, have, were really worthwhile in the long run. Nellie Bly rolled in bed confused and tired. Then, in her recollection, an idea struck her to traverse around the earth, and not just in any fashion, in record-breaking fashion. Bly wanted to beat the fictional Phineas Fogg's record of traveling the world in 80 days. His story was published by Jules Verne and became immensely popular when translated into English. When Bly proposed this idea to her editor at the New York World, she was denied because he believed only a man would be able to make the trip unchaperoned. She told him if he sent a man, then she would take the journey for another paper and beat him. Her editor trusted that Bly would and decided not to take a chance. So Bly set off for London after packing exceptionally light from Jersey City, New Jersey. After making her way to London, she took a small detour to Amin's friends to meet Jules Verne, as he was the creator of the man who Nellie was trying to beat. He encouraged her and hoped she would triumph. From there, she traveled to Italy, Egypt, Yemen, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Singapore, and then to Hong Kong. Upon arrival in Hong Kong, Nellie learned that she was in a race with a woman named Elizabeth Bisland, who had been sent out on the same day as Nellie by the Cosmopolitan magazine. Nellie had no clue she had a rival, but decided to push on to Japan, where she boarded a ship to San Francisco on the 28th of December. Taking a personal train car upon arrival, Nellie had proceeded to traverse across the United States until she arrived back in Jersey City, beating Phineas by eight whole days and coming ahead of schedule at a record-breaking 72 days. She beat Bislin by four days, and Bislin never spoke of her journey publicly after her arrival. Nellie had become a worldwide sensation after this trip, and it paid exceptionally well for the New York world. 
Nellie Bly suffered through a lot, a tough childhood, an incomplete education, gender boundaries, mistreatment of what was supposed to be a health institution, a hard trip around the world, arriving in Europe days before the breakout of World War I, a failed marriage, the collapse of her inherited company, and even being abandoned by her own family. Nellie Bly truly suffered through hard times. After her trip around the world, Nellie Bly didn't stop reporting on various cases and events. In the late 1890s, Nellie met Robert Seaman, the owner of the ironclad manufacturing company that, at its peak, could produce more than 1,000 steel barrels daily after Nellie Bly's patent. She soon got married to Seaman while he was in his 70s and Nellie was in her she 30s. She opened up the door for lots of other people to come forward and have courage to look at things that other people don't want to look at and name, name names and, and call people out on things that are really unethical. Nellie's marriage was void of love. After Seaman died, Bly took the throne as the CEO of Ironclad Manufacturing. There, she patented the 55-gallon oil barrel, but after being sued for fraud, the company succumbed to debt, and Bly returned to reporting. After returning to reporting, she was the sole female reporter on the eastern front of the First World War after some bad travel planning, and she even critiqued the women's suffrage movement for their lack of fashion sense afterward. Her family abandoned her after she didn't hand the company's assets over to them after she left for reporting. Bly died in 1922 from pneumonia, pretty much alone from the results of her actions. Bly had so much success and fame in her early years as a bold, intriguing journalist, and then dropped off as the years went on to bad business choices and a sad end alone from her family who abandoned her. Nellie Bly's life was truly one of many triumphs and many tragedies. Because she provokes and she inspires, and that is her triumph.